with all that. Write the instructions to the uh, corresponding pointers that you've created. Then you're going to want to repair all your conditional jumps, mark the new section of memory as executable, then you run it. And assuming that everything worked out fine and all your f all and everything is pointing at the right place, weird things happen when this gets all messed up. So uh, yeah, it's ju it's just a lot of messed up instructions and bad pointers, and you're jumping into really weird locations in memory. So once it all works, you run it. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? <laughs> so why does this really matter? Is is this really just a trick and pony show, or is it you know doing anything? Like, does this actually do anything useful, or does it just look pretty? So the actual utility of this is that once you isolate the assembly instructions and the once you actually isolate the assembly instructions, we can put the individual assembly instructions anywhere we want simply based on a formula rather than having to write an entire function that will likely be fingerprinted by AV or something like that uh, and just be able to write a whole series of mathematical functions that will just draw a whole bunch of, uh, will draw a whole bunch of assembly onto, onto the code, uh, onto the code and into, into memory. So in order to obfuscate the clarity of the code path, all you really need to do is make a bunch of functions, maybe select them at random, maybe select them, you know, iteratively or something like that, or just, you know, determine based on, you know, who you're attacking or something like that, generate a random mathematical thing, and you can do all sorts of stuff. So if you want to uh, perform various polymorphic techniques, you can also use this mathematical formula to do that as well. So instead of having to write your code that, uh, Manipulates your, like I was saying, manipulates your code in a specific way every time. Uh, you can write uh, just completely random functions that uh, decide to. Uh, you can, yeah, you can write a series of functions and then just have those functions specifically. Yeah, the alcohol is really hitting me now. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Audience commands it, so uh, so instead of writing code, yeah, I already said all that. And remember that anti-reversing isn't specifically about just you know finding the really cool hip O'Day anti-debug techniques. It's really not about doing all of that. I mean, sure, you could do a really awesome thing, break out of Ida, spawn last measure everywhere, and completely fuck with the reverse engineer. But at the end of the day, you know. It's really about just being a complete dick to the reverser. Because if you're a complete dick to the reverser, he's just going to get pissed off and say, you know, fuck this malware. And just walk away. And meanwhile, you'll be able to sell all your bots to the Russian business network, no problem. Because you're just pissing off every reverse engineer that's out there. They don't know how to Google for shit. They don't know what the hell you're doing because your code is all fucking messed up. And it's it just you know they're just getting pissed off. The, it's it's a game of psychology, really. So if you're extremely creative and can figure all sorts of just different things to do out, then you're going to be a really awesome anti-reverser because it's really about just completely fucking with people. That's all anti-reversing really is. Sure, it's you know it's there's a technical aspect to it as well, but. <laughs> You know, you're really just trying to get them away from your code. That's all it really is. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the obfuscation function and I'm going to obfuscate it. Then I'm going to take the obfuscated version of the obfuscated function and I'm going to obfuscate the obfuscator again. So let's pull up the code. All right, so here is mathtroll.exe, which essentially contains my sine wave example. Uh, you can see, let's see, uh, obfuscate by formula. So here is obfuscate by formula. And you can see the assembly instructions here. You know, they're all in working order and they're going to, they're doing their thing. Uh, if you look at the code, uh, it won't help you. Uh, it, this is just the assembly instructions of everything that's been compiled and you'll notice that I use C++. I'm very sorry. I try to avoid C++ as much as possible. So let's see here. Where did I put that breakpoint? Ah. Right here is where the actual, uh, this is where the obfuscated function is. So once it gets here, it actually, uh, this is going to be the obfuscated function now. 
So as you can see, the uh, jump instructions have been applied. There's a whole bunch of just different stuff in this buffer that makes it look uh, a whole lot more obfuscated than it really is. And it goes to each and every individual instruction just perfectly fine. And uh, it's, it, I'll show you the shape in, a, in just a moment. This is just arbitrarily, I can just hold F8 the whole time. Or actually I can just run it and it'll still be fine. Yep, there it goes all the way to the end. So the code is still fine and it's, it's now uh, in, there's a bunch of different jump instructions there. So it, it, uh, it looks messed up, but I'll explain why it's not that messed up in a moment. Here's a, oh, oops, wrong direction. Here's a visual representation of what the uh, stack looks like. E every time this happens, uh, I generate a random sine wave formula that will uh, arbitrarily, you know, make a, a bunch of different shapes. But this is the coolest one of uh, of the batch, so I decided to put this up. The I believe the uh, code starts about. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. I think it starts about here. I can't remember exactly. But it wraps around and it keeps going. And this is basically what you're seeing is the actual code flow. So it goes all the way, you know, it just, it just does a cool sine wave. But I mean, it's not just sine waves. You can also do spirals too. So you can, it, I, and these are really the only two formulas uh, that I included on the source. Like I said, you can do a whole lot of other creative stuff that you want to. And this is, what, what this is essentially, is just a diff from the initial buffer and the finished buffer, and it's, it actually just looks exactly like that, and it's surpri it looks pretty cool to me. But you know, the issue is that you're using unconditional jumps, so and that's really bad because if you use unconditional jumps, like I said, you're just the code flow is still exactly the same because the unconditional jumps were there to begin with. So if you have the unconditional jumps there, all you really need to do is go from the entry point to the end and get rid of the jump instructions. All you have to do is read those instructions and boom, there you go, you got your code and it's completely unobfuscated. So how do you deal with this? Well, the inverse of an unconditional jump is a conditional jump, which goes in two directions, which makes it more awesome. In fact, you could say it's 50% more awesome. <laughs> So if we, but th that provides a very interesting dichotomy because, well, if we need conditional jumps but we also need unconditional jumps, what the fuck do we do? So that's what, opre that's what opaque predicates are for. So for those who don't know, an opaque predicate is essentially a, um, a Boolean statement that always evaluates to a specific version no matter what. Uh, so let's consider the uh, null space expansion I talked about earlier. If you have a set of instructions and they have unconditional jumps between every instruction, it also follows that a series of assembly instructions which don't have a direct effect on the assembly can be applied. For example, uh, as long as you write sp very specific instructions that don't modify the underlying assembly of what you're trying to obfuscate, like, uh, like, that, like if you're trying not to mess with the registers, then as long as you maintain the state of every assembly instruction, then you're good to go. And this is pretty awesome too. So you can consider every assembly instruction to be able to be wrapped like this. You have your preamble, uh, your assembly data, and then your postscript. And the preamble is essentially what comes before the assembly instruction, and the postscript is obviously what comes after it. So the preamble section can be, is typically used for two things, or it can be used for two things. You can uh, repair the after effects of the previous preamble of the uh, past opaque predicate. Uh, the anti debug code chunks can uh, go in there too. But it, it, the preamble is very limited because you can't really do that much. The postscript you can do a whole lot more with because it's actually going into the next instruction so you don't have to really worry about it that much. So you can do a whole bunch of other stuff uh, as well. So what can this section be used for? You can put opaque predicates and obfuscated jumps to link to the very next section. Uh, Anti-debug you can also stick in here too. General code flow obfuscation, that sort of stuff. Encryption. One of, one of the things that I, I think would be really, is really cool is that actually I'm working on it right now, is being able to encrypt and decrypt every, every single instruction so that af as every uh, instruction is executed, it decrypts the next section and decrypts the next section and decrypts the next section. Oh, by the way, here's a bunch of anti debug in the preamble. Oh, I guess you don't get the rest of the code. And there's all sorts of other stuff you can do with that too. So here's a great example of this. Uh, 
Um, uh, in green, we have our preamble data and a very generic call to uh, is debugger present, which, uh, you know, it, all it does is once it uh, figures out that there's a debugger, it gives you the finger and jumps to some random code section that will probably spawn last measure or something awesome like that. Who knows? And uh, we have a very simple uh, opaque predicate here at the bottom. You know, it, it, you maintain the value of EAX. Uh, in the post in the postscript of the top instruction, zor it so that Jay Z thinks, oh well, I obviously can go either left or right. I think I'll go right because it's zero. And then you pop EAX and you get your EAX back, and the next instruction isn't modified at all. Then you got the next instruction, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this introduces a whole lot more issues uh, because uh, what you're going to wind up running into is uh, it's going to be really hard to determine which instructions affect which uh, and there's all sorts of other nonsense. If you have schmooballs, I highly suggest you throw them at me because I'm going to be that guy because I didn't finish all of that. So, okay, good. No one has schmooballs. I'm safe. Uh, our f of x formulas also don't necessarily need to be iteratively run. Like you can, you, you don't have to do just f1, f2. If you're clever, you can figure out uh, specifically uh, how many instructions you're going to have, and then for every instruction, just f of 27, f of 54, f of 9, and that will essentially place your instructions in random places. And when you do that, uh, depending on how you wrote your code, that will allow you to. I shouldn't have had ice. That will essentially allow you to uh, determine. Man, that alcohol, I shouldn't have had that last shot. Wow. <laughs> For that long a pause, I kind of deserve it. So you can essentially. Uh, just determine it iteratively and it will still link your instructions. They'll just be completely randomly placed. So if your, com if your code is generated from a predictable formula, then it also follows that the entry point is predictable. So you can take this to one level more before you actually wind up getting to your code. You can essentially uh, obfuscate the entry point in some way or another, do a whole like, like 300 assembly instructions that just gets the entry point. And oh, by the way, here's a little bit of anti debug and oh, it manipulates the entry point just so much that you can't even run the code. So there's all sorts of stuff you can do there too. So there are various drawbacks to this as well. Um, so you're, yeah, there, there are various issues that you're going to be still running into this, even though this is pretty cool. So, um, this technique assumes you have thinly compiled code. So if uh, you've basically compiled it with either GCC or God forbid VC++, well VC++ is actually pretty cool for a few reasons, but you know actually all compilers suck. What am I talking about? Anyway, um, if this, this really assumes that you have sanely compiled code because as it's disassembling uh, the, the instructions, it's following a very simple path. So it's not going to assume that there's all sorts of really weird tricks that are going on. For example, if you have an opaque predicate that goes off into la la land, then uh, it's going to fuck up and add those instructions and your code's going to be all messed up. So if you're trying to obfuscate somewhat obfuscated or manipulated assembly, it's not going to work out that well for you. There's also a massive memory footprint because as, here let me go back to the image to show you. There's a lot of blue space here and there's not a lot of red space. All the red space is a code, all the blue space is, sure there are things you can do to make it a whole lot more efficient, but there's obviously a whole lot of extra space there that's going to be an issue for you. So it's going to have a massive memory footprint if you want to do it right or if, as, yeah, if you want to isolate out the instructions. Uh, yeah, you're dealing with a gigantic data set. So it gets significantly larger when you obfuscate more than just one function. So if you have some really awesome packer you downloaded from Malcode or something like that, well, really hope it's efficient for you. So uh, function pointers are unpredictably fucked. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. It really depends on what, the, what you're doing. So it, it, it's, it's definitely going to be an issue there because uh, you're not